Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to take two. <laughs> this is uh, our weekly opportunity uh, and privilege to connect with you wherever you are. This is my wife, Stacy. I'm Hello. Tullian. We are broadcasting live from the auditorium of our church, the sanctuary in Jupiter, Florida. Uh, and we do this every Tuesday night from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the primary purpose of this is to connect with you uh, midweek. Uh, but we also go over the sermon that I preached two days ago. We discuss it. We unpack it a little bit further. We answer questions that you may have submitted during the week. We talk about our lives, what's going on in the world, and whatever else we want to talk about. <laughs> so uh, I brought... Or a, a we cookie. eat cookies and drink things, water or coffee. I had dinner before we came, but now he's I didn't dessert. have dessert. So please don't mind me. <laughs> <laughs> I when before it went live, I could see we just both talked to our oldest sons before we got to church. Before we, we were at home, he was talking to Gabe. I was talking to Cole, and then I I have the live stream on my iPad right here. And Gabe, if you're still watching. Gabe, we just got off the phone, buddy. FaceTime. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, I meant to offer you a bite, but I've got almost nothing left, honey. Would you like a bite? I appreciate it. Huh? <laughs> I mean, there's a little bit left. Would you like a bite? Are you not going to eat any of this? Oh, I'm going to eat it. I'm just trying to be nice in front of our friends. Otherwise, I wouldn't, otherwise I wouldn't have even offered it. But since you're watching, I feel obligated to seem nice anyway. Um <laughs> um, so we hope that you had a good weekend. We hope that the start of your week uh, has been good so far. It's only Tuesday, mm -hmm. um, but ours has been productive. Uh, Sunday was a remarkable day yeah. here at the sanctuary. So good. Uh, usually, at least in my experience, uh, the Sundays after Easter are typically a low Sunday, attendance Sunday, uh, because I don't know why, honestly, people figure we went to church on Easter. We don't got to go <laughs> next week. I don't know. Um, but this past Sunday was one of our highest attended services ever, uh, which was super surprising mm -hmm. and exciting. Uh, my good friend, Stephen Miller from Nashville, Tennessee, mm -hmm. led us in music. Uh, and I started a new sermon series called Irreligious, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but there were lots of new people who came. Tons um, of new people. We the got to meet young a lot adults had an event yep. right after church that was actually well attended, and uh, yeah. that was sweet to see. There were that. ministries starting mm -hmm. um, that are starting without us, That's which right. is really good when people <laughs> in the church want ministry to happen. And so um, mm -hmm. our adopted daughter, Reagan John, uh, came and said she's 20. Four, Three. almost no, 23. She'll she be, will 24. be 24 on Cinco de Mayo, right? May 5th. Um, and she said, Would you guys mind if I there are a, a lot, there are a growing number of people my age coming to church, and I'd love to sort of gather them together and kind of mm -hmm. start a young adult 20s and 30s kind of deal. Would you guys mind? We were like, Run with it, Reagan. So she's done it, and uh, there are a growing number of them. Mm -hmm. So that was and they're having fun, yeah. And so that was, and they're connecting with one another. So that mm -hmm. Happened this past Sunday. Um, Another funny thing, we went to go eat. We were meeting Stephen Miller, our worship leader for Sunday, and his wife Amanda mm -hmm. that night for dinner. Sunday night, we were going to meet them for dinner. Mm -hmm. And if you are near Jupiter, then you know, like it was supposed to rain all day Sunday. Mm -hmm. And it didn't. And then all of a sudden, like there was this storm that blew in at like three, four o'clock in the afternoon. Rained like so hard. And there was, there were it was tornadoes. Like a hurricane. It was, there were it was tornadoes. Um, it, was it was like the like end of the world. Blowing through. And the place we told them to meet us to go eat dinner, we like pulled up and didn't even think about it. The owner comes to the door and he's like, hey, we're, we're having a private party. Plus, we're closed because the tornadoes took, took out the, uh, electricity for like, <laughs> like two we miles. didn't even know it. No, for like and two miles. And we live like five minutes from there. So yeah. we didn't, cause it yeah, didn't affect so, and our then it, and then electricity. It, then it cleared up and, it's been Yesterday beautiful. was beautiful and today was beautiful, but oh, so beautiful. Um, before I forget, let us know where you are watching from. Yeah. Uh, there are people who watch from all over the country, from different parts of the world. Mm. 
We love to see that. We love to connect with you. <coughs> um, and, and I just wrote in a couple of the comments pre live stream to remember to like and share and follow Tullian's Facebook page and his Instagram page and the Sanctuary Facebook and Instagram. So do that. Share, like. If you want and, somebody to know about this good news that you hear every week, share it. And I, let me just advise you that when Stacy tells you to do something, I on on with my personal experience with this, just do it. Okay, your life will be a lot easier if you just do what she tells you to do. Because if she tells you to do something and you don't do it, <laughs> well, what what? You suffer the wrath. Uh huh. I I do have a bad wrath. No, she doesn't. <laughs> she doesn't have bad wrath. Is that even a phrase? Bad wrath. I just made it. She doesn't up. have an anger problem. It exists okay. now. Okay. Um, so let us know where you're watching from in the comment section. If you're watching on Facebook, you have an opportunity to mm -hmm. tell us where you're watching from in the comment section. Also, we do, as I mentioned earlier, answer questions that you submit during the week. Um, at the end of our broadcast, we answer one or two questions. Uh, so there is a form you can fill out mm -hmm. at the top of the page, mm -hmm. a link where if you click it, there'll be a place you can go and submit a question or a comment. Mm -hmm. um, you can also write your question in the comment section on Facebook, either my Facebook page or the Sanctuary Facebook page, wherever you're watching this from. Um, it can be a biblical question, a theological question, a life question, a personal question about mm -hmm. us, a personal question about you, um, whatever it may be. There are, there are no questions that are off limits. Right. And if one of you asks a question that is obviously off limits, We'll tell you, or we, don't we won't have answer. The answers to all the questions. No, you may ask. no, we don't have to answer the question you submit. <laughs> but we look at them all, and then we choose one or two, and yeah. we answer them. Uh, we do keep it anonymous, so we may say your first name, but we won't say your last name. So you'll know we're answering your question, but nobody else will know who you are. Uh, what else is going on in the life of us? Us. Um. We started Mandalorian. <laughs> so we watch... Lots of movies and series. Right. And we're a little late to the game with the Disney Plus But thing. we told them last week that we, got, that we have Disney Plus and we were starting Mandalorian last Tuesday night, which we did. Did we? Last That's Tuesday we said. We, said? we were like, we have Disney Plus and you were like, we're going home to start Mandalorian. Well, we did, and we <laughs> finished season one, and we're four episodes into season two, and we will probably go home tonight and watch two more episodes. There are only eight episodes each season, yeah. and there are only two seasons, so we're... Uh, by next Tuesday, we'll be done, and we'll give... No, we'll, yes, by next Tuesday, we'll, oh, we'll, week, we'll be we'll done be totally by done. tomorrow night, but right. Right. Uh, we'll give you a report next week. Uh, and if you have any other suggestions yeah. of shows, Prime, Netflix, Hulu. Disney+, Plus, Hulu, whatever... Let us know in the comment section. We are always in the market for mm -hmm. a new series. We may not watch what you suggest, but, no. but we might. No, we may. There's a good chance that we will. <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll look it up first. We'll do our research. And if it looks interesting, then we'll watch it. Right. And then we'll talk about it. <laughs> uh, in fact, we ended the broadcast last week. Was it last week we ended the broadcast? About or was movies. it the week before about movies? I think it was last week. Because you said yeah. this week... Right. And we're going to talk the whole hour about I, movies. I, <laughs> we could talk the whole Forget hour about, about movies. Forget about the Lord. Forget about the sermon. We'll talk about movies. Yeah, we did. We talked about, um, we talked about movies. Uh, we, my wife said that my favorite movie were all the Rockies. No, I didn't say all the Rockies. I said Rocky. Which I had to ask which one? Cause there's five. You had to ask that, but that's not what, what I meant with the question. I'm still very confused by this. Uh, it's hard for me to convey to her that when she says my favorite movie is Rocky, I go, which one? There's right. five of them. There's and Rocky. Four. Right, because I clarified right. that last week. Okay. Um, so, what else do you want to talk about before we talk about the sermon? I'm a little scared to even ask the question. What else would you like to talk about? Nothing. Huh? Nothing. Nothing? I, no, I'm ready to go. I want to talk about this sermon because I'm excited about this series and so many people are um like seriously stoked about it and it's it's going to be super fun to like just you unpack, know, unpack it. it every single week more yeah. than once because the women in open door we're going to 
that's the women's ministry here at the sanctuary. We are going to follow. So tomorrow night we will talk about the sermon. On Sunday. Uh-huh. We will talk about the same passage that you used yeah. on Sunday. Yeah. So, um, and we'll unpack it, you know, maybe yeah. in a way that is more, um, you know, agreeable to women, like just more uh, Im- important specifically to women. Gotcha. In certain ways. Gotcha. You know. Yeah. Well, uh, as my wife mentioned, I started a new series this past Sunday. Uh, two weeks ago, I concluded an 11 part series on the Ten Commandments called Unmasked. And then last week, uh, I preached for Easter a separate standalone sermon. And then this week started a new series. I'm not sure how long it's going to be. I was looking at that this morning. Um, it was going to be six weeks. It actually could be 12 weeks. It's either six or 12, to be honest with you. Not in between. No, not in between. Because the way that I've got it sort of laid out, I mean, it'll either be six or 12. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, I absolutely loved kicking it off this Sunday. Um, It's a series that I've entitled Irreligious. And I titled it that way on purpose because I wanted it to be uh, provocatively titled um, <laughs> for a reason. I, I want to demonstrate throughout the series um, that there is a huge difference between religion and Christianity. Uh, and in order to make that case, uh, we looked specifically this week at Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, But I got us started by saying that there was no one who was more hostile toward religion than Jesus at all. And when we think about religion and we hear the word religion, we tend to think about God. We associate religion with God in one way, shape, or form. Uh, And the point that I wanted to make this past Sunday was that in reality, religion has nothing to do with God. Religion is all about us. It's about what we do. It's about our obedience. It's about our performance. It's about our faithfulness. It's about our commitment, our devotion, all of that stuff. Um, And it's really not about God. It's about us. Whereas Christianity is not first and foremost about us and our work for God as much as it is about God and his work for us specifically in the person of Jesus. And so I mentioned at the beginning that I've been saying this kind of thing for years. And every time I do, I always get some pushback from people because they point to James chapter one, verses 26 and 27, where at least in one of those verses, James uses the word religion or the word that is translated into English as religion in a positive way. So James says this, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. That was verse 26. Verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So the question always comes to me or the pushback that I've always gotten when I make this distinction between Christianity and religion is this. Um, Why would I use the word negatively when at least in verse 27, James uses the word positively? Um, And so I showed in a couple of other places in both the Old and New Testament how the same word that is translated in James' religion positively is translated negatively in other places. Um, And so really it depends on the context. And so I describe the context into which I am talking about religion. Uh, And when I talk about religion, I'm talking about it negatively. Um, I'm talking about it more in terms of the way I just described. It's not so much about what God has done for us. It's about what we must do. Um, it's the kinds of things we have to do in order to get God to love us, that we have to get right, get clean, and get busy if we are going to ever hope to be on God's good side. Um, 
And so this whole series is devoted to distinguishing the religion of just do it with the gospel of it is finished. So that's the sort of the, the foundation of the sermon and the whole, or the series, and the whole point that I wanted to make at the outset was that there was no one more anti-religious than Jesus, no one who is more hostile toward religion uh, than Jesus, because religion is all about us and what we do, and Christianity is all about grace. It's about what God in Christ has done for us. Religion's main message is our need to do more and try harder for God. Religion is all about earning and deserving and getting better and measuring progress and scorekeeping. And uh, religion may give lip service to Jesus hanging on a cross for us, but its emphasis is you and me climbing a ladder for him. That's really what it's about. Um, and sadly, um, this is the message, the content that makes up most sermons and books and social media posts under the heading of Christianity. So it's super important um, to understand this difference because what passes for Christianity today is much more religious than it is Christian. Uh, it's much more about what we need to do, if we're doing it right, if we need to do it better, how to do it better. It's all about us. It's Another way to put it is, in today's culture, the focus of the Christian faith is the life of the Christian. Mm -hmm. It's all about our life and how we're living it and what we're doing and how we can live better and all of those things. Um, and Jesus and his accomplished work on our behalf uh, is almost like a subplot to the main plot, which is about me and how I live my life. Um, so in that sense, Christianity is emphatically not a religion. In fact, Christianity, as I mentioned on Sunday, contradicts religion, completely contradicts it. Um, the Christian faith is not fundamentally about keeping a moral code. The Christian faith is fundamentally about a God who saves people who fail to keep the moral code. Um, that's what we see throughout the Bible. Um, and I said that Christianity, as I mentioned a minute ago, is, is about grace, and grace defies religious logic. It has nothing to do with earning or merit or deservedness. It, it's opposed to what is owed. Uh, grace is love coming to us that has nothing to do with us. Uh, it's one-way love. It's undeserved favor. It's God meeting us in our messiness with his undeserved mercy. It's God meeting our guilt with his grace and our faithlessness with his faithfulness 10 times out of 10. Um, and because of that, no one battled against religion more than Jesus. Um, in fact, the religious leaders hated Jesus. Uh, and we looked at that passage in Luke chapter, what did I say? Seven? What was it? Luke chapter seven? Luke yeah. Luke chapter seven, 36. 30, yes. 50. Um, where it's that well-known passage where Simon, a Pharisee, uh, invited Jesus over to his home for dinner to meet with some other religious leaders. They were evaluating whether or not Jesus was really who he said he was. Uh, is this man from God? Is this man God? Is he the promised Messiah? Who is he? Is he just a teacher? What is he? Um, and so they had him over and they were discussing whatever it was they were discussing. And at some point during the dinner, the town prostitute barges through the front door, uninvited, falls at the feet of Jesus, begins washing his feet with her tears and drying his feet with her hair. Uh, and this scandalizes the religious men around the table, scandalizes them. And they concluded Jesus must be an imposter because God would never allow such filth to touch him, ever. They assumed that God was for clean people, that God was for good people. Um, and so Jesus tells them a little parable. Uh, and the, the main point of that parable was to show that the Pharisees, and Simon in particular, rather than the prostitute needing to become more like them, that they needed to become more like her. Uh, and so Jesus showed that God is not for the good and the clean. God is for the bad and the dirty because the bad and the dirty are all that there are. 
Uh, there are those who know they're bad and dirty and those who think they're good and clean, but there's no one who is not bad and dirty. Um, and so Jesus was wrecking every religious category that these religious teachers had regarding God, who God is and uh, who God befriends and who God associates with. Uh, they were under the impression that um, God was primarily for all things right, clean, good, holy, uh, and then, of course, they assumed that they were all of those things, and she was none of those things, so God was for them, and God was not for her. Um, and Jesus showed the exact opposite. In fact, um, the way I put it on Sunday is that Jesus points to the prostitute and says, Simon, you have it backwards. You think she needs to become clean like you, but I say you need to become aware of your dirtiness like her. Um that Jesus tells him he has a lot to learn from the prostitute, not the other way around. Uh, and so we just, we, we spent some time unpacking that. Um, and I just, I loved uh, the passage. I've referred to that passage on numerous occasions. I can't remember ever preaching from that passage. It's a powerful story. It shows how Jesus completely flips the script and turns everything that we think about God inside out and upside down. Uh, in fact, this story really does challenge some of the assumptions we all have about God, even if you grew up in church, especially if you grew up in church. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were sort of taught, maybe not explicitly, but it was at least implied, at least in my experience, that church was for good people, that church is where the good, clean people go, that the bad people, the nasty people, they're out there. They don't come to church, but we in the church, we're the good people of society. We're the clean people of society and so on and so forth. Um, and throughout the gospels, we see Jesus turning that picture or that assumption inside out and upside down. Um, that God loves and uses weak, guilty, bad people who fail because there aren't any other kinds of people. Um, there are those who are think that they're good, and there are those who know that they're not. But there is no one who in and of themselves is righteous and pure and good and clean and all those things. Um, and so... Uh, so that's what we spent our time on Sunday mm -hmm. discussing, talking about. Um, like I said, I have no, I don't even know what I'm preaching this Sunday, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm toying with the idea of preaching from the parable of the prodigal son, mm -hmm. as which I have preached from that passage one other time. But I'm toying with doing that because I was thinking, what would be a really good follow-up mm -hmm. to this introductory sermon mm -hmm. from Luke chapter <clears throat> 7? And the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15 is another one of those places where mm -hmm. the flipped is com the, the script is completely flipped right. um, regarding how God deals with sinners. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really the, the crux. There is a mm -hmm. religious way uh, that we think sinners ought to be dealt with, and then there is a Christian way that Jesus demonstrates for us time and time again mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how God deals with sinners. So, um, I mean, that's sort of the basic summary of it. You can mm -hmm. go back, if you missed it, You can, you can. can. it's on my Facebook page. You can go to the Sanctuary YouTube channel. Um, you can go to the Sanctuary Facebook page. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all there. If you um, missed it, you should go listen to it, watch it, listen to it. Again, I'm telling you what to do. So I think you should too, long. not because I think the preacher is some great preacher, but because the content of the gospel uh, in that passage and the assumptions that uh, are challenged, our own assumptions that are mm -hmm. challenged regarding who God is, is so explicit in that mm -hmm. passage that I absolutely loved spending time in that passage, thinking about it, mm -hmm. thinking about my own religious proclivities. Mm -hmm. Um I tend to view sinners uh, much more like Simon the Pharisee than Jesus, especially people who sin differently than I do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think we we read this story and we go, my gosh, you know, this guy, mm -hmm. Simon, what a jerk. What an arrogant jerk. I yeah. mean, thinking that he's not a sinner and that she is and how mean he is to this woman. And Jesus is so sweet. But we do the exact same thing. I mean, I said on Sunday, if you have ever been... 
If you're inside the church and you've ever gone through something really bad, you've done something really bad, um, maybe you got divorced, something you, you've made a massive mistake or a mess of your life, uh, churches don't typically, and the Christian community doesn't really know what to do with Christians who fail. And so they kind of wash their hands of them. We, we tend to believe that Christians who fail need to be put out, abandoned. Uh, well, it's and Christians that fail by definition of what they see as failure because they're not thinking that they are a failure. Well, of course. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. A Christian. Right. I mean, that's right. The very reason we are a Christian is because we're failures. Like we, we, we need, need yeah, Christ yeah. to save yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I said, I said that I said the big, did. the big difference between Jesus <laughs> and cancel culture, which mm -hmm. is all the rage mm -hmm. right now, um, is that while our culture cancels people who have done terrible things, mm -hmm. Jesus cancels the terrible things that people are canceled for yes. huge difference. Um, and so the sins and the scandals that we choose not to forget, Jesus chooses not to remember. That's the big difference. And we... We tend to remember people by their worst moments, their deepest sins, their greatest failures. Um, and what's so interesting about Jesus is that he really befriended, loved, and touched the outcast, the misfit, the leper, the liar, the sexually deviant. I mean, that's why the religious people questioned whether or not he was an imposter. Mm -hmm. They thought he was an imposter mm -hmm. because they were like, God would never hang out with people like this. Mm -hmm. Clearly this guy is not God because God would never hang out with people like this. And we tend to do the same thing. We separate ourselves from people like mm -hmm. that because we think we're doing God a disservice or we're being unfaithful as Christians mm -hmm. if we do associate with people mm -hmm. like that or befriend people like that mm -hmm. or hang out with people like that. Um, it's it's a real epidemic inside the church, in my mm -hmm. opinion. I even, I was thinking about this because we talked a little bit Sunday after, afternoon, cookie break, um, Just for me. about this passage because it's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. It's one of my favorite pictures of the kindness of God. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm a woman and I've you know done things in my life that I'm extremely shameful um, of. And so thinking of this whole entire scene and how um, if you've ever done something that you are just so embarrassed about, so shame, ashamed, have so much of. ashamed of, you're guilty you and you know it, um, no matter what the scene is, uh, to go into the presence of people that you know would look down on you in any way is paralyzing. Mm -hmm. And the fact that um, the, the verse that comes to mind as soon as you enter this scene is the kindness of the Lord leads to repentance. Mm -hmm. And this is a picture of that. Yeah. Um, and it's not the Pharisees administering law to this woman and saying, we know where you've been and we know what you've been doing. You don't belong here. Don't touch him. Get out of here. Like, you know, be gone. Like, you need to come back when you have repented. <laughs> and um, where does, what does that sound like? Right. Honestly, it sounds but like the way exactly, churches operate. That's exactly how they operate. Yeah. And in things much smaller than something like the town process, in things much smaller than that, um, it can be things that are, you know, People can well, be yeah, so we, petty we, about sin, you know, but this woman comes in here to this room that really would ultimately paralyze someone with guilt and fear and all those things. But the kindness of the Lord leads her to the feet of Jesus. And it's such a picture. I told you this on Sunday. To me, it's such a picture of the cross. It's like such a picture of exactly what God sent Jesus to do for us and to decipher religion and Christianity mm -hmm. for us. And he's sitting in this chair. Obviously, he's sitting. Uh, I think it, you know, it kind of... He's reclining at reclining table. Reclining at table. <laughs> and um, I like <laughs> Jesus. And um, she's at his feet. And I was telling you on Sunday that I feel like, you know, if Jesus, his view from the cross is um, obviously not reclining, but he's stretched out and he's looking at his, I mean, if he were hanging there looking down, he would see that is what's under his feet, sin. 
That's what is at his feet. And this woman comes to his feet. She doesn't go to his shoulder or in his hands or to his face. She goes to his feet with her sin, her tears. Her tears are just oozing her guilt and her shame. And um, I believe repentance. Like you don't do that unless the kindness of the Lord leads you to there. And that's why she was there because she knew she would find grace, that she, the gospel would meet her in that. Um, the good news that Jesus loves and uh, redeems us, like that that's what he's doing for us. And um, that he'll let us, he touches the lost, the lame, the least, and the leper. Like that's who he allows in his presence because that's who he's for. Let not conscience make you lin linger, nor a fitness fondly dream. Mm. If you tarry till you're better, you will never... You, you, if you tarry... Till you're you, better. You will never come at all. Right. Uh, I think the sentence before that. Look it up that. on your phone. Okay. When I, can't, when I can't recite a verse yeah. from a hymn by heart, it drives me nuts. It, let, not, um, uh, let not conscience make you lin linger, nor a fitness fondly dream, if you tarry till you're better. Wait, no, look it up. I'm, I'm, I've got two verses going at the same time. Yeah, because it's one line before that. I can't read that. Okay, I'll find it. It's at the um, bottom. But anyway, I just no, think that Let me read a, this. Yeah, Seriously, this, the, is, this, is from, this is from Come Ye Sinners, Poor and Needy. Mm. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready waits to save you, full of pity, love, and power. Mm. Come ye needy, come and welcome, God's free bounty glorify, true belief and true repentance, every grace that brings us nigh. Let not conscience make you linger, nor a fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. Mm. Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. That's, I mean, that's just... And that's the thing, like her need was shown in the fact that she's at the feet of Jesus like she needs him so I, desperately, she would bust. I wish I would have like remembered that. that to use this hymn on Sunday. Like in my, see, this is why I don't like going over the sermon a couple of days later because then I think <laughs> of things I wish I would have said. Well, we can't go over it before. No, but I can talk about it right now and tell you how much <laughs> I regret not saying this on Sunday. But um, you know, I, the picture that you alluded to it—the mm. picture of this woman. Mm -hmm. uh, barging into this room mm -hmm. where the people who looked down on her the most fiercely mm -hmm. were all gathered together. Um, I mean, she she walks into this party of religious people, falls at the feet of Jesus without any concern for what others are thinking and saying. She was acutely aware of her guilt and shame. She knew she needed help. Mm -hmm. She didn't care what it looked like to other people. Mm -hmm. um, she was at the end of herself. She wanted to be clean. She needed to be forgiven. And she came to Jesus knowing that he would help her. Mm -hmm. I mean, she is a living example She's of this. Of let not hope. conscience make you linger. In other words, don't let your don't, don't let it. guilt, well, don't don't let your guilt and shame keep you mm -hmm. from coming to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Let not conscience make you linger. Nor a fitness fondly dream. In other words, mm -hmm. Don't think you have to become stronger in order to go to God. Don't think you have to become better, cleaner to go to God. Let not conscience make you linger, nor a fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. That's all she felt. She, she didn't, she had nothing else going for her except she knew, I need Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself was enough to get her through the front door mm -hmm. without any care or concern at all about what others thought. And you get that way. When you get to the end of yourself, mm -hmm. when you get to the mm -hmm. point where you are so desperate mm -hmm. to feel clean, to be forgiven, for your guilt to be taken away, for your shame to be removed, when you get to that point, you're almost like, I'll do anything, I'll go anywhere, mm -hmm. I'll try anything. And she, there's no record in the Bible, I said on Sunday, that she had ever met Jesus before. Mm -hmm. Clearly, she knew something about him, and she knew he would be there that night. Mm -hmm. It was probably well known in the town that, hey, this, this sort of this, uh, you know, mountainside mm -hmm. prophet is mm -hmm. in town, and he's having dinner at Simon's house. She heard about it, barges through, and... And I know. also think it's like such a picture of, you know, when, when we talk about the scripture, perfect love casts out fear. 
Mm -hmm. And sometimes we'll be like, why are you feel fearful in our marriage? Like, I love you, you know, but we, we don't have a perfect love for one another in case you didn't know that, but we don't. I mean, <laughs> but listen, you know, but <laughs> I, let me say this. I don't have perfect love for her, but she okay. has perfect love for me. <laughs> Isn't that a nice thing to say? I do love you. So Isn't that much. a nice thing to say? That's adorable. I mean, that's like the, that's what. See, husbands take note. You say that kind of stuff to your wife. Okay, it's good. All right, go on. But I, I think <laughs> I, I mean, we both can speak personally to this. Yeah. Like those moments that you're most fearful to face people or be in the presence of people that you would be looked down upon and you know just, just treated badly or whatever. Jesus is the embodiment of perfect love and. So that is true in this moment, that his love for her, not because she's truly, totally conscious of that, but that is what, like it casted out the fear yeah. of hers to go in there. Yeah, like it's right. the proof of the power of she God's knew, love and kindness. And she knew what she would find in Jesus. Right. She knew, I mean, she just, she knew that he would help her. Well, and what else did she, she have to lose? Right. What, and that is yeah, the, that's right. what you quote Janis Joplin all the time, which is so true. Like, what else do you have to lose in that moment? Yeah. I mean, if he's not the one, it doesn't matter. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter. And we're all, and even the, the, I, the Pharisees in there, they are like still the people standing, looking at Jesus while he's hanging on the cross. That's why I think it's like such a picture. And they're still going, is he supposed to be the king of the Jews? Well, he should pull himself down off of there. He should, why doesn't he call on his God to like do something for him and help him and all of these things. And um, that's why I just love this passage. And I just, and it's I, such the religion Christianity contrast in it because it's showing time. it. Well, and I just, listen, whatever they told you <laughs> regarding your need to be good, clean, right, better, uh, guilt-free, uh, impeccably moral, um, whatever the case may be, in order to be close to God, it's a lie. It's just a flat out lie. I mean, it is, I can't stress that enough. It's a lie. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to go out and try to be dirty and bad so no. that you can get close to God. You are, okay? It's a fact that you are more than you realize you are. And God draws near to you that's the whole point of the incarnation, mm -hmm. that while we were at our worst, God gave us his best. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the whole point mm -hmm. of God becoming flesh and dwelling for a while among us, taking on human frailty and dying on the cross mm -hmm. and living the life we should have lived and dying the death we deserve to die and rising again to conquer sin and death once and for all, all for us, not because we deserved it, but because we needed it, not because we were good, but because we were bad. Uh, and so if you're a Christian and you think, well, I, I, my distance, my sin that I'm aware of is preventing me from going to God. Like I need to clean myself up. I need to get myself right before I can ever hope to have any kind of relationship with God. It's That's the antithesis mm -hmm. of Christianity. Um, what was the example that you used when we were with Amanda and Stephen and you used that, a great example. Did I? About, it was not yours. It was like from someone else, like an older um, person that maybe you read before was in a professor, but it was something about like being, he used an example of a man and he was like, if you were going, going to the, you needed to go to the doctor. You had cancer. Oh, no, no, no. That's, that, no, or, that was, was, that, that, was that was on Sunday morning. Did you do that? Oh, Sunday yes. I just too? read it right before we started. It's Fred's oh, okay. the quote from Fred Smith. Yes. If you, if, <clears throat> if and then I just ad-libbed it at the end. Yeah. I'll, I'll, let me, okay. I'll, you'll, you'll, it'll be, okay. all be clear in a minute. Okay. I said, uh, I was quoting Fred Smith, who was Steve Brown, who's a friend of mine, his mentor, who's been dead for a number of years now, who used to speak to men at different men's groups. He was this millionaire business guy who was a Christian, and he devoted a lot of his time to mentoring men and ministering to men specifically. And one of the questions he would ask when he would go speak at these places 
to these groups of men is if you got arrested for drunk driving on Friday and it was on the front page of the paper on Saturday, would you go to church on Sunday? Mm -hmm. And of course he said, a lot of the guys were like, uh, no, <laughs> if I got arrested for drunk driving on Friday and the whole town found out about it on Saturday via the front page of the newspaper, uh, not that we even have newspapers anymore. Do we? I don't know. The interwebs. But whatever. If it was okay, on this the was, interwebs. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't go to church on Sunday. And his response was, you realize how ridiculous that is. That's like getting into an accident mm -hmm. and the amp getting being mangled in an accident and the ambulance picking you up and you saying to the ambulance driver, all bandaged up and mangled, would you, before we go to the hospital, can we please run by my house first so that I can clean up, put on a fresh pair of clothes, and get clean before we go to the hospital? I mean, I don't want to show up like this. He said, that's how ridiculous mm -hmm. it is um, that we go to God broken, mm -hmm. mangled. Mm -hmm. We go to God hurting. We go to God with our guilt, with our sin, with our shame. Uh, we go to God with these things. It reminded me of a, of a story that my, one of my professors in seminary <laughs> by the name of Sinclair Ferguson told us. He said that years ago when he was a pastor in Scotland, uh, back in Scotland, oftentimes communion services are the church mm -hmm. in groups gather around a table uh, and then they pass the elements and then they go back and sit in their seats and the next group comes. Mm -hmm. And he said, so this group came up and uh, the minister is passing around the, the, the cup and the, you know, the, the wine and the bread. Um, and he said there was a woman sitting at the table who, uh, whose head hung low in shame, clearly. And when the cup came to her, she mm -hmm. grabbed it and passed it to the next person without drinking it. Cold, cold chills because you're saying this story. And the minister grabbed the cup gave it back to her and he said, woman, drink. It's for sinners. <laughs> um, and I just, so I think we, I think we make the mistake of thinking that God is not for sinners. <laughs> um, that's something very different than saying God loves sin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, clearly that's not the case. We know that's not the case. Sin hurts us. Sin enslaves us. Sin is destructive, not only of ourselves, but of the people around us. That's why he hates it, because it hurts us and it hurts others. Um, but to say that God hates sinners or that sinners can't go to God until they clean themselves up um, is a message that may not be explicitly... It, you may not find a preacher out there. There are some, mm -hmm. but you may not find a bunch of preachers out there that say, you need to clean up before you go to God. Mm -hmm. I mean, God is pure and righteous and holy, and you need to clean up your act clean before your you life. go to him. Clean up your life before mm -hmm. you go to him. Uh, we may, they may not say that, but you'll hear them say things like, mm -hmm. God will bless you if you obey him. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, you, you, know, you do your part, God will do his if you're part. you're actually a Christian... This. Yeah. If you're actually a Christian, you'll do this and then stand back and watch God bless you for that. In other words, it's still, um, there's still this impression. It, it, at the very least, it's an impression that is made mm -hmm. um, that God is only for the clean and competent. When in reality, what we discover in the Bible that God is for the unclean and the incompetent. And when measured against God's law, like we did in the Ten Commandments, we are all unclean and incompetent. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought it was also, you always talk about how, you know, um, there's t two ways to approach people. And sometimes you deliver the law to them. Like you, if, if they're hard hearted, like the Pharisees were in this scripture, and then you have the prostitute and she's obviously broken hearted, broken hearted. And the gospel is delivered to the broken hearted. And it is in this story. It is in this passage. Mm -hmm. He delivers the gospel to her, and he delivers, admonishes he the law. The law. He, yeah. he gives the law to the hard-hearted, which those things are both for God's people. I mean, he's saying that to um, even you know to his disciples, and I mean, he's, he yeah, he he will speak either or. And I think even in that this scene, he speaks both, and it's because of the condition of their hearts. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, he in that, so, which religion can harden us. It's a summary of what Martin Luther said, which is essentially, um, God gives us two tools, his two words, law and gospel. We talked about this a lot in the Ten Commandments mm-hmm. series. Um, God speaks two words to us, law and gospel, and he gives us two tools mm-hmm. for our toolbox, law and gospel. And we're to give the law to the hard-hearted and the gospel to the brokenhearted. If you give, um, if you give the law to the brokenhearted, you you kill them. Mm-hmm. Um, in other words, the hard-hearted person needs to hear the law. Mm-hmm. They need to be crushed by the law, mm-hmm. so that they can have ultimately be cured mm-hmm. by the gospel. Right. Uh, so, the Pharisee Simon needed to hear, "You got it backwards, buddy." Mm-hmm. Rather than she needing to become more like you, you actually need to become more like her. In other words, God was, Jesus was using the law to sort of mm-hmm. sober him up, mm-hmm. flatten him, make him realize that he was no better than her. Just because he was a religious leader didn't make him any closer to God mm-hmm. than her. In fact, she's closer to God than you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I quoted somebody who, I don't even know who said this originally, (laughs) but I found it years ago, that the devil's masterpiece is not the prostitute, it's the Pharisee. So good. Um, And so uh, the laws for the hard-hearted, Jesus delivers the law. And and this is is a complete side issue. I don't want to get too deterred Mm -hmm. by this, but it's a complete side issue. And then we need to go to some questions, if we have questions. And if we don't... Let's talk about movies, but... (laughs) <laughs> we, can, we can talk about food. So, yeah, we've done that too, honey. There's no, got to be some more to life than food and movies. There's not. There's just <laughs> uh, So, um, uh, but I don't want to get off on some tangent about this, but this is a really, and may, maybe I'll ask a question to myself and then answer <laughs> it. Parents will come to me regularly yeah. and say, listen, I, I want to be gracious to my child. I really do. And I want to be, I want to be grace oriented. Mm-hmm. I want to be, I want our home to be a grace place. Mm. What do I do when my kids misbehave if I want to be a gracious parent? What do I do? And I say, mm-hmm. listen, there's a distinction <clears throat> between being a grace person mm-hmm. and being a law gospel person. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let me make this distinction very carefully because there were times in my previous church where people in an encouraging way would say, I love that this is a grace message. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm glad. Mm -hmm. And it is, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. It's a law gospel message. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not a one word message. It's a two word message. Mm -hmm. It's a, I need to give you the law so that you will be exposed. And then I need to give you the gospel, which ultimately exonerates you. So parenting, for instance, I tell parents all the time, you don't have one tool in your toolbox. You have two tools. You have law and gospel. Mm -hmm. To your hard-hearted child, they need the law. They need the law, not because we believe the law is what changes them, Mm -hmm. but the law is what breaks them. The law is what... um, the law is what crushes them mm-hmm. so that they will eventually and hopefully ultimately be cured by the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, so it helps even in relationships to know, okay, it's not about just being a grace person. No. It's about being a law gospel person, a law grace person. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then asking the Holy Spirit to help you discern what's needed in which moment, Mm -hmm. because it's hard. Even in counseling sessions, I've had to pull both tools out of my toolbox, but it's not easy because I go, I've encountered um, what appears to be a hard-hearted person who just underneath the surface is a severely broken-hearted person. And then I've also encountered people who appear on the surface to be Mm broken-hearted, but once you dive beneath the surface just a little bit, what you discover is that they're really hard-hearted. So it's not easy to discern in the moment, is this a hard-hearted person that needs the law or is this a broken-hearted person who needs the gospel? Ultimately, that's why Martin Luther said, the only one who ultimately knows how to distinguish law and gospel is the Holy Spirit. We trust the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. to do what he needs to do mm-hmm. uh, in using whatever tool we use. But um, I think it's really, really helpful. It, it, 
it's actually very liberating because I don't then feel enslaved to never giving my kids the law. Right, only using one or the other. Yeah, like I if mean, I am only using the gospel, like you know, and or, nothing's happening. Like, or well, if I, have I to use be sweet, or if I use the law and I think I shouldn't be doing this, I should be, I should be a grace guy. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, there are times. Okay, mm -hmm. we are broken people living in a broken world with other broken people. And that means the law is still relevant in the life of even the Christian. I mean, we are That's still, right. we are, we are in need of the flattening power of God's law. We are prone towards self-righteousness. We are prone towards selfishness. Uh, we are prone toward pride and all of those things. And it's God's law that sort of pushes us back to the gospel. Mm -hmm. It's God's law that crushes us so that we will run to the gospel to be cured. Um, and so I think that's a, I just think that's a hugely important and very practical thing right. to keep in mind. Right. And it goes back to what you actually started explaining in your uh, sermon on Sunday and then tonight, just about the difference in religious, uh, religion and Christianity and religion is about a God, but it's about us, like yeah. the gods little that G, I little, make, little, little G, G gods, God, yeah. um, and Christianity is about God. Um, and I, that is typically like the law crushes the religion out of us. You know, if it keeps doing it, it's killing work. That's what it's doing. Yeah. It just kills that religious, um, those religious tendencies or um, wrong definitions that yeah. we've gotten like mixed up. Uh, that's why I think it's so important that you defined those two things. Well, that, and that's so even the sermon this past week, it, every sermon. I preach, but this sermon this past week is a law gospel sermon. It's showing, mm -hmm. it's retelling the story, and then it's showing we're actually a lot more like Simon than we are the prostitute. That's right. We're we're judgy, and we're you know the way that I put it. I didn't say it this way Sunday, but we're great lawyers when it comes to our mm -hmm. own sin, and great judges when it comes to the sins of others. Right. Um, we tend to point out the speck in our brother's eye while ignoring the log in our own. Um, we tend to think that just because you sin differently than me, you're worse than I am. Uh, we are constantly gravitate toward thinking we're better than other people. So we're actually a lot more like Simon the Pharisee than we are the weeping prostitute. That's the law portion of the sermon. It's using Simon and what he's doing to expose the fact that this is kind of like the way we are. It's our diagnosis. Right. It's we're being diagnosed. Simon is the tool that Jesus is using to diagnose us. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, the gospel comes in in seeing how Jesus responds to this mm -hmm. broken person. You could say that the prostitute was also broken by the law. That's right. The law of her own Sin. sin and the law of her own consequences right. for the like sins of her hurts. life and right. her own self-destruction. I mean, she was crushed by the law of life and consequence. Right. And being crushed as she was, she flees to Jesus for the gospel. So, you know, the first part of the sermon is always intended to diagnose us and to help us go, oh gosh, I'm <laughs> not the good guy in the story. I'm the bad guy in the story. Jesus is the good guy in the story who loves and welcomes the bad guys in the story who admit that they're bad. Mm -hmm. That's ultimately this, this story and any other sermon that I'll preach from any other mm -hmm. passage. Um, and I wanted you to say that because I love everybody loved that. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to have it in there, actually. That's why it's down here. We're supposed to be cut off. I know, but it was <laughs> and so I, good. And it was, I, I didn't say it here. I said it somewhere yeah. up here. But... Um, I was preparing and I just said, okay, what, what's the scene here in this room with the religious people and this prostitute and the distinction between Jesus's reaction to the prostitute, which is Christianity and the Pharisees reaction to the prostitute, which is religion. And, uh, the difference is that religion points fingers and the gospel gives hugs. That's the difference. Um, that's the big difference. And I wish I would have said what? on Sunday mm -hmm. that the difference between religion and Christianity is embodied in the difference between how the Pharisee responds to the prostitute and how Jesus responds to the prostitute. Mm -hmm. That's it. And I didn't say that. Well, I mean, I think it, the point got across. Right. Did it get across? 
Uh, I think it did. Which means you think that there are a lot of people who don't think it did. No. <laughs> I can't speak for those people. Um, anyway, the same is true, by the way, if we look at the parable of the prodigal son, mm -hmm. that the response to the return of the younger brother mm -hmm. by the older brother is the response of religion and the response of the father to the return of the younger brother is the response of Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, um, we have five minutes. Well, and Stacy is mm -mm. frantically searching no, for just, questions. Um, and we have a few, but mm -hmm. do you want to, you want to ask, do you just want to, what do you want to do here, honey? You're, she's supposed to be the administrator. I'm, I'm just, I'm just here to talk. Ugh. She's supposed to handle all the questions, whatnot. She's looking at me like. Well, we ah. haven't had any questions, and what you said last we didn't? week is it, we didn't have any. We had, we had some no people send us stuff this week, but they weren't questions. What's they the were, matter with you guys? They were I, every week, I, 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 let me let me handle this real quick. Every week, I look at you, all of you, wherever you are, and I say, we are veiling ourselves to you. We will answer whatever questions you ask. And we'll do it online. We'll do it on air. And you're telling me that after all of those invitations to all of these good people to ask questions, nobody asked a question this week. No. Well. Okay. Well, then what do we do about it? How do we, 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 we this is the time to answer questions. <coughs> do you have um, any suggestions of what we should do? Do you have well, a question for me? No. I have a question for you. Okay. But I want to see if you got a question for me. I, I don't have one off the top of my head, no. Okay. Um, what did you do today? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you were with me most of the day. They I woke weren't. up at 730 out of the blue, and it was beautiful. And I got up, and I started reading my little normal stuff. Which is? Preparing. I read, um, I have a Tim Keller marriage devotional. Okay. And uh, Chad Bird's devotional. So you read both of those? Both of those. Which one was better? Don't answer that question. Go on. <laughs> they were very different. <laughs> just, I'm just kidding. Um, and then we had our staff meeting at 11. You went from reading devotions to staff meetings. Well, then Stuff you got happened. up and we visited. Right. We talked and we, right. like we always do, I got coffee and yeah, we talked. I, and, right. And then we realized, oh my gosh, we got to go to staff meeting. We were yep. so engaged, engaged in our conversation. In our conversation. Morning coffee conversation. And then we had our staff meeting. And then I met with Cherie and Shelly. Well, hold on. You're going too fast. Okay. Hold well, on. This, this, is, this is a day in the life of Stacy. So hold on a minute. Really so we, yes, it is. So we, we had our staff. We, we, we had realized staff we're sitting on the couch. We realized we got to go to staff meeting. Oh my right. gosh, we got to stop our conversation. Right. So you went and got ready. Mm -hmm. I went and got ready. Mm -hmm. We drove separately because we you stay do. here I and I leave after a staff mm -hmm. meeting. Right. Um, so we had our staff meeting. We had our staff meeting, which is comprised of you, me, Daniel, the man behind the camera, the man behind the curtain, the man behind uh, the curtain. Cherie Moore, and mm -hmm. Shelly John, who team up with you to lead our inreach ministries. Yep. Um, and then when that meeting's over, we talk, we, that goes on for about two hours, the staff <laughs> at meeting, least. right? Mm -hmm. Two hours mm -hmm. at least. What are you saying? Like at you think it goes hours. too Sometimes long? Sometimes it starts at 11 and ends at like 1.30. I don't think it ever goes that Daniel. long. Daniel, sometimes he has to leave at 1.30 and sometimes like he is leaving right when we are finishing. Well, I mean, Okay, so but staff, I love staff meetings. I mean, we talk about it's not all business. We catch up about the church. We talk about people who are coming, people we haven't seen. Uh, you know, everything that's going on. Every, yeah, everything that's we going talk on. About everything. And then after that's over, you meet with Cherie and Shelly. But today you were in there for most of the half, first half of our entire meeting. Yeah, we were all in there eating lunch in the workroom, mm -hmm. and then. We and we solved a lot of the world's problems. Yeah, as we always do. As we always do. Should be no surprise. When, when Wednesdays are better, it's because we've all been meeting on Tuesday. Okay, hold on. Now go on. And you guys were meeting. We met. I left. You left. We finished our meeting talking about all of the volunteers and ministries and upcoming yeah. events and all that fun stuff. And then Shelly and Cherie left. I had a counseling call that I had with a lady. Um, who doesn't live here, doesn't live but here, reached out and wanted to talk. part of our church family in South Carolina. And her, all of her whole family is part of our church family. And then I went straight home and I talked to my oldest son, mm -hmm. 
changed my clothes, came back here. See? I mean, that's... I, I cooked some meatballs she while did. I was on the phone with Cole. So uh, that's a day in the life of my wife. <laughs> and I was there for a portion of it. When I, I left here and I went and had a two hour long conversation with Trey, one of our worship leaders. Mm. And we, I had a whole list of things from our staff meeting to go <laughs> through did. with him. So yeah, we covered list. a lot of ground and it was extremely productive. Um, I finished that at about four o'clock. I drank a little pre-workout drink, went to the gym, came back, recovered, sat on the porch and talked <clears throat> to Luke Enfinger. Uh -huh. Who used to be our worship leader our worship about some leader. licensing issues that we're having with songs and things like that and getting uh -huh. all that squared away. Um, made a couple social media posts about the sermon. Mm -hmm. Then I got dressed and here we are. And here we are. And you talked to Gabe. I talked to my oldest son, Gabe, who FaceTimed me while I was eating a chicken Caesar salad for dinner, <laughs> which did not satisfy. I had the meatballs on the stove and he's like, what's in there? And I was on the phone and I said, meatballs. But then he didn't eat them. No, and I do like meatballs, but uh, we got to go because we're out of time. <laughs> but I, before we do, I just want to mention what my wife had for dinner last night. Oh, my gosh. Night. I knew you were going to do that. So last night was our monthly board meeting, and Stacy was at home, and I came home. It was about 9 o'clock, and uh, I hadn't eaten dinner yet, so I made some rice and some chicken. <laughs> par for the course for me. Uh <laughs> And uh, I went in, and she was laying in the bed, and she was watching American Idol, American Idol. or some and stupid show that like that, or some ridiculous show like that. And then uh, I said, have you eaten yet? And she's like, well, nah, yeah, yeah, yeah. she kind of said, I think I ate like a... Partially. I said I had an avocado. Right. So she gets up and, and goes into the kitchen, mm -hmm. and... Uh, a, a Reese's this Easter is, egg. Uh, don't steal my thunder. It was so... My thunder crazy that I actually tweeted out on my Twitter feed what my wife had for dinner. Stacy had a... Uh, An avocado. A, another avocado. No, just one avocado. Oh, so you didn't have one before? No. Okay. I had one avocado. Okay, you said a minute ago that you had an avocado and some kombucha. I did. I had an avocado, some kombucha, and then I ate... Oh, she ate avocado... Um, uh, Reese's peanut butter Easter egg <laughs> and a bowl of honey nut cherries. That was her dinner. Bam! Follow me for more meal <laughs> tips and ideas. And I was like, this is the most... Uh, now, about two weeks ago, she <laughs> ate... This was her meal. This was her dinner. I was like, what are you eating for dinner? She ate an avocado, a bowl of raisin bran, and one single meatball. <laughs> and it was I, like this big, though. But I tweeted that out, Lenora's. too. I was like, my wife just ate an avocado, a bowl of raisin bran, and a meatball for dinner. When I... I mean, I, I don't tweet and that much. Well, you know, a handful of times a week. But the tweets about my wife's dinners <laughs> get the most discussion. They don't So, either. anyway. Oh, my gosh. Um, okay, we got to go. Okay. We, Love you guys. We next. have fun. We have fun with you guys. We hope you have fun with us. And we will see you next Tuesday right here. Unless you tune in Sunday morning, mm -hmm. 1030 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Our faith, the Sanctuary, Sanctuary Facebook page, Sanctuary YouTube channel or my Facebook page for Irreligious Part 2, Part D. And follow me for meal tips. Yeah. So. Okay. Good night.